In our first segment this morning, we're going to focus on an area that's becoming far too common. We know there are inherent risks in the work we do. There are risks from operating and burning buildings, responding to and operating on roadways, risk from infectious diseases. We know these risks exist, we prepare for them, we train to minimize them, and we develop better PPE to protect against them. But more and more often, you are facing an emerging threat. Yes, active shooter falls into this category. But so does assault on you, our members, by simply doing their job. And what's interesting is if a police officer is attacked in the course of doing their job, it is considered an assault. More often than not, there is an arrest. However, when one of you are struck on the job, it's just part of doing your job every day. It's not okay. That too is an assault. It should result in an arrest and it should result in a conviction. Our panel of speakers will address this topic in detail. So let's get started. Our first presenter is Kelly Adams from Detroit Local 344. Kelly has been with the D Detroit Fire Department for 17 years. She is also a certified chaplain. In 2014, Kelly became a field training instructor where she worked to transition firefighters to medical first responders. It was during this assignment when Kelly Excuse me, it was during this assignment that Kelly, when the city was short on medics, was called back to work on Medic 6, and her life changed forever. Following Kelly will be firefighter paramedic Ben Vernon. Ben, a member of IFF Local 145, has been with the City of San Diego Fire Department since 2006. On June 24, 2015, Ben's life changed when he responded to a call for routine medical assistance. Ben will share his story and his journey of recovery. And while it's critically important to understand the risk that you face on every run, it's equally important that we do what we can to help prevent these occurrences, prepare you for when they can't be avoided, and share the lessons learned so we can all be safer. Which leads me to our last panelist of this segment. Dr. Jennifer Taylor is an injury epidemiologist and associate professor of environmental and occupational health at Drexel University School of Public Health in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. She received her doctorate from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. She has served as the principal investigator on three FEMA research and development grants. Two of those projects researched models to build non-fatal firefighter injury data systems. The third developed the Fire Service Organizational Culture of Safety Survey, or FOCUS, to assess fire service safety climate. She is also a longtime friend and collaborator with the IFF. As stated earlier, while you, our sisters and brothers in attendance, are certainly used to seeing some graphic images that will follow, I want to caution our guests in attendance. Some of these images you will see are disturbing, but we believe they are necessary to truly understand the dangers we face on the front lines every day. Before our speakers come to the stage, please turn your attention to the video screens. We saw a strange number of struck by against injuries reported by paramedics and EMTs in a fire department. And we couldn't imagine what was causing those injuries. And it turned out that they were getting struck by their patients. Two EMTs in Philadelphia had to fight off a patient who attacked them in their own ambulance. All new at five as NBC 10's Stephanie Jimenez shows us this new attack is part of a much larger problem. We put ourselves in danger all the time. You get kicked a lot in the ambulance, it seems like. And they, they always try and go, you know, always try and sucker punch you. They are lashing out at the people who come to help them. Paramedicine is very close work, and there's not a lot of time to necessarily protect oneself, and you're not expecting that that's what's going to happen. The most dangerous call I've done so far in my career was, was the most routine thing I've ever done, so kind of messes with your head a little bit. Just I started having nightmares, like the most amazing nightmares I've ever had, like the most graphic, violent nightmares. 
and to the point where I wasn't sleeping. I got, I guess you'd call a crash course in PTSD. Our medics are incredibly stressed. They are doing too many runs. They are not given enough time to recover from their work and they are seeing suffering in our communities. We don't respond with more units and more paramedics and more training when we have more need. We just make them do more work. And so I'm concerned about their injury and their mental health that could result. We actually had a fire company the other day that arrived on a trash fire and found somebody standing there with a machete, basically waving a machete around, threatening them. We understand as scientists what's going on in your work environment. We understand you're getting assaulted by patients. We understand there's a lot of stress in your work environment. We can provide that objective data we need to say this is, this is what's next to properly support our medics nationwide. Hi everyone, I'm Kelly. Um, I want to say thank you to the IAF for inviting me and to my local union, Prez, who's out there somewhere, Mike, local 344, that's us. Hi, Mike. <laughs> okay, anyways, I'm here to tell you guys my story, just a little bit. Um, violence is rampant in um, the fire and EMS system, and a few years back, I was assaulted. It wasn't me that was assaulted first. My partner was stabbed. And I'm you. I could be your sister, your, some of your mother. I could be your partner. And my partner got stabbed. And I jumped out and I helped him. And in helping him, I got attacked. So. <laughs> okay. So, and a little bit about what happened was there was, there, it was just your regular run. These aren't, you know, dangerous runs. We never know what we're going to be on. And within seven minutes, that's all it took from the time I called dispatch to say that I needed scout, I was uh, being cut with a box cutter. So... Am I using the right one? Oh, okay, well, this kind of explains what I just said. It's, I was fighting, and that's what happened. That could have been your sister, your mother, your mother. <laughs> but it happens, and it happens more often than not. It's not, are we gonna be attacked? It's, when are we gonna be attacked? I've had seven surgeries, excuse me. My face is paralyzed on the left side. You can't tell because I have amazing doctors. Unless I'm laughing, then you can tell. Some of you might see that later on this evening. But um, yeah, my eye wouldn't close for the longest, well, it just closed six months ago because uh, like I said, my doctor's amazing. This was, Pushing the wrong button. <laughs> this is what I looked like seven days after my attack. And they had put a platinum piece in my eye so I could close it manually so I could sleep at night. But I also wore a patch because everybody likes to be a pirate. <laughs> this is the gentleman that decided it was okay to attack EMS. He had a box cutter and he stabbed my partner in both hands. The box cutter went through one of his hands. His hand's like this permanently now. And yeah, that's his story to tell. But this is me in court. I was by myself. They had me testify. I had to wear a mask because for the first two years, I drooled a lot because of my injury. The lady standing next to me in this picture, what we didn't know at the time is the man that attacked me had been attacking people for 10 years in the city of Detroit. He was not only a rapist, he was a murderer. He had killed a 15-year-old little girl and raped her afterwards, and that was her mother. We became fast friends in court. This was my fourth surgery because my face was twisted. The doctor was trying to straighten it out, so they did a lot of, and I had a lot of nerve damage. So my doctor, I don't wanna say experimented with my face, but she worked on it a lot. 
I felt like Frankenstein most of the time when I was at home. Every six months I was getting another surgery. We didn't know right at the beginning my nose was broken because, it, because he punched me first. And what that did was collapse my sinus. I still can't breathe correctly, but I had surgery on my nose. This was my last surgery. While I was getting ready to come out, I blew a blood clot and they kept me for five more days to get heparin shots. To, so, you know, I didn't die before this event. Um, these are the things, this is what I looked like two months ago. And like I said, you can't tell, but she fixed my eye and it's the little things, the eye. I, that was my big thing, I couldn't close my eye. And we take these things for granted every day that we run into these houses not knowing what these people are gonna to do to us, why they wanna attack us. This, I don't know why it happened, but it did. And it happens more often than not. Now I can't forget about it. I can't not think about it because every month I have to go have laser treatments because the nerves are dying as we, they're, they're dead, dying, they have to regenerate them. And then I get the Botox. Most women would be like, yes, free Botox. Well, it's not like that. It doesn't feel good, it's through the back of my neck, and it's all just so I don't, so I'm not twisted. That's the easiest way to put it. And I'm gonna have to do this for the rest of my life. And I didn't ask for this. I went to work to help people. That's what we do. But in that situation, someone decided it was okay to slice me from my ear to the corner of my mouth, which I found out later is called a joker cut in prison because he felt like it. So that's just the physical part of it. The mental part of it's even worse. And in our jobs, we do not, we suck it up, buttercup. That's what we do. If you see something terrible, you go back to the firehouse, you talk about it, you take it home, and then you don't talk about it anymore. But it gets into your soul, and it bleeds out. You don't think it does, but it does. So if you, you need to get help, we need to get help. This profession, they didn't know 20 years ago when we started, or whenever it started, when I started, whoops that this was gonna affect us mentally the way it has. We all think we have a handle on it. And I'm gonna tell you this, they diagnosed me with severe PTSD after the fact, and my first thing was, that's not for us, that's for people in the service. That's for people that fight for our country. But the thing is, we, we go to war every day, we just don't know who the enemy is, because they're dressed like us. And they're out there, and they're going, like I said, not when, or not if, it's when. They don't discriminate. I had a 210 pound man fight me like we were in a boxing ring. And I was doing pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I made it out, we both made it out alive. But the whole system, there was no policy. How do you help someone that's screaming for help? I did have the audio, but I can't, I still can't bring myself to listen to it without you know, rolling into a ball, maybe next year. But it, it shows a timeline of seven minutes. What is, you know, us running and getting the laundry, seven minutes went from two people in a truck to two people bleeding to death. And one man walking away. And there's no policy in place. There was, who's gonna come help us? No one. We had to drive ourselves to the hospital. Uh, the cup holders in our ambulance were full of coagulated blood. They put the ambulance out of service because it looked like a murder scene from me and Ro, my partner at the time. And he's no longer with the department. Just, they let him come back as soon as he said, okay, I'm good and now he doesn't work for us anymore. And nobody really knows where he's at. And that's the thing that needs to be addressed. When there's a problem, someone needs to talk to you about it. You need to 
Share the wealth, share your pain, share your grief, whatever. Because like they said, we're brothers and sisters and we have. The general public doesn't know. You're not gonna go to Thanksgiving and tell them about the dead babies you see. But you see them and you see them more often than you want to. You see old people that die and, and you're with people at the most important times of their life, being born, dying, being shot, and then you are expected to go home and be normal and clean the pool, put gas in the car, fight with the wife and husband. And they don't understand, and sometimes you don't think that you have a problem because, you know, suck it up, buttercup. We'll get over it. And we will. We'll all get over, we, we will all work together in a amount of time. But there's a session that you all can come to <laughs> that Jen's going to have. And I wrote it down so I wouldn't, it's in the, hang on, hang on. The Hermitage D room at 1.30. It's going to be a QA and a and she's going to explain more of what she's got going on. And I appreciate you all listening. And maybe I'll see some of you at 1.30. Thank you. Ben. Thank you, Kelly. I'm also going to share my story with you about workplace violence. And the clicker's not working. All right. So I don't need to reintroduce myself, uh, but I am going to show you this picture of me for two reasons. The first is because I'm absolutely gorgeous in that photo. <laughs> The second reason I show that picture, yeah. The day that picture was taken, I'd been a firefighter for one day. But you look at that picture, you look at my face, the second reason I show you that picture is that's a guy that doesn't think violence is gonna happen to him, it's not gonna happen in my department, that's always something that happens to somebody else, somewhere else. See, need, fill need, this is my favorite all-time firehouse saying. Everybody has a version of this. See a job, do a job. If you see something's broken, please be the person that fixes it. Now, when you start off as a new guy, when you see the floor is dirty, you mop it. But this is a national convention, and the people on this stage are bringing you national problems. <clears throat> Violence is a national problem. So let's fix it. Let's talk about my incident. Now, my incident was caught on tape, and we're going to watch it. Now, I'm going to show you some slides, some pictures, and then some video. It's intense. How did I end up here? Let's talk about it. The gentleman in the white t-shirt is my patient. We're not on scene yet, but this man is intoxicated. He has drank over a gallon of vodka. Uh, he looked a lot like you guys did at the bar last night. <laughs> the gentleman you see in security guard uniforms, I want to make this clear, this is not San Diego PD. These are trolley security guards, but they got guns and badges. And the gentleman in the black shirt is going to be the guy that tries to kill me uh, a few minutes later, I affectionately call him Stabby. His full name is Stabby Stabberton. <laughs> now what you got to understand, and I'm going to kind of fly through these pictures, but what's happening is the drunk guy is not being cooperative, and he is just being belligerent and a jerk, and the trolley security guards are not working well with Stabby. Everybody's getting frustrated with each other, and everyone's, the, the call is escalating, and blood is starting to boil. And it's at the point where it's almost going to come to blows, when we arrive. Now I took this picture because I want to show you that the city put this railing down the middle of this sidewalk to separate the trolley riders from your pedestrians. And as you see the still slides, the picture's on the left, but the fight spills over onto the right and the video will take place on the right side of that railing. And what I want you to see is as the fight breaks out, it starts coming my way. I try to back up and escape and I run into that railing and I run out of room. So I think I'm the only firefighter in history to get trapped. 
outside. <laughs> this is my engine company, engine four. We're the busiest engine in the city. We are the fourth busiest in the nation. We average 25 calls a shift. Uh, this is our 10th call of the day and our third time at the trolley stop already. When I get out, I get a turnover from the guy wearing a body camera, and he says, hey, you got a drunk, intoxicated male. At no point does he give me a turnover that, by the way, we've almost come to blows with a bystander. We don't get that. So we grab our gear, and we walk over a block to get to our scene. As we find our patient, we kind of circle up. We make our protective bubble like you guys are used to. There's nine of us total, four firefighters and five security guards with guns. My partner jumps in, starts an assessment, and look at me. I get a turnover from Stabby. It's about 30 seconds. I listen to what he has to say. He doesn't really give me a lot of helpful information, but I placate him, and I thank him for his help, and he says, no problem, and he grabs his backpack, and he walks away. And if you're looking at my face, you see that I am now focused on my patient. What I don't see is if you look over my right shoulder, Stabby didn't go very far. He actually was still pretty pissed off, and so he comes back, and he wants to re-engage, and he wants to get back into that verbal, physical, violent argument with trolley security guards. <clears throat> but what happens is, he actually ends up going after my captain. And he gets in my captain's face, and he starts putting his finger in his chest, and he starts cussing at him. And my captain just says, hey, man, I need you to back up. I need you to back up and give us some space. And he pushes the guy back. The guy trips over a park bench. And there it is, the ignition. Now, we've been only on scene 90 seconds when this fight goes sideways. Now he gets up and he starts slamming into a security guard. And if you look over my right shoulder again, you'll see he is absolutely throttling this security guard. So I break away, I run over to help, and my thought is I'm gonna tackle this guy, we're gonna put him in handcuffs, and this fight is gonna be over. But before I can get to him, they hockey check him over that railing and it spills over onto the other side of that railing. The fight doesn't stop. Stabby gets on his feet and he just starts pounding a security guard. So I jump over that railing, and as he hauls back to punch somebody, I get between him and the security guard, and I push him apart, and I say, stop it, stop fighting. And I'm trying to figure out what's happening. Now, as you can see, my hands are up, and I'm trying to calm this guy, but watch Stabby's right hand. He's slowly reaching for a knife. Now, I don't see that, but I know right away this is going ugly. Here's my security guards, pepper spray in the air. Thank you, fellas. Fantastic job. But right now, guys, what was nine on one is now suddenly one on one. And this guy's got a look in his eye I've never seen before, and I know I'm in trouble. <sighs> so I start backing up, and there's that railing, gets in my way. Yeah. That uh, severed a nerve in my back, missed my kidney by an inch. Look at the look on his face. Yeah, this one broke my rib, <clears throat> punctured my lung, almost killed me. I don't know I'm being stabbed. But what you gotta understand is when he, I think I'm just being punched. When he pulls the knife out of my chest, all the air in my lung goes out sideways and it knocks the wind out of me and I double over and I go, Ugh! and he tries to stab me in the head and he misses. Now, when I came back to work, my entire department had watched this video and they go, Benny, you are such a badass. He tried to stab you in the head and you totally ducked that guy. <laughs> and I go, damn right. <laughs> I'm like a ninja. <laughs> but that's not what happened, I just got insanely lucky. Now, I want you guys to know, you'll be proud to know, I adhere to the three most fundamental rules to being a firefighter. Rule number one, always look good. Rule number two, always know what you're doing. Rule number three, if you can't follow rule number two, please revert back to rule number one. I am losing this fight. I have no idea what's happening. And my first thought, I fixed my sunglasses. <laughs> now I'm gonna play the rest of this video in slow motion because I'm gonna replay this entire clip you've seen in real speed and I want you to see how fast this fight actually happened. Alex ran over, he uh, grabbed that guy and he slammed him on the ground and he ended up getting stabbed three times trying to save my life. 
However, I do have a bone to pick with the IAFF. Alex jumped over that railing, tackled that guy, saved my life. He was given the Medal of Valor from the IAFF for saving my life. But three seconds earlier, I jumped over the railing to save a security guard. I got nothing. <laughs> Somebody in this room owes me an explanation and a beer. Okay, here's that same clip, real speed. Okay. Can somebody play that clip? Cover now! Cover now, cover now, cover now! That entire clip is nine seconds. Two men stabbed five times in less than three seconds. Now, I got rushed to the hospital. I had a hemoneumothorax. I had air and blood trapped in the space. My lung was collapsing. <clears throat> and I was rushed into the trauma room. And I got to say, there were engine and truck companies <clears throat> that are already waiting for me in the hospital trauma room. And I was so grateful to see my people there waiting for me for the moral support. That was, of course, until they moved me onto the trauma table and the nurse stripped me naked. <laughs> they decided they were gonna have to give me a chest tube and the doctor was prepping the chest tube and one of my guys said, hey doc, this is a little embarrassing, you mind if we cover Ben up and give him some privacy? And the doctor agreed, so my buddy stepped back, covered me up with a cocktail napkin. One of my other buddies yelled out, dude, that's a waste of half a napkin. <laughs> Not cool. But I did manage to find a picture of what that must have looked like, and I'm pretty sure this is how I looked. <laughs> <clears throat> now, you gotta understand, a couple months, <laughs> four months earlier, I had earned the nickname Olaf, the snowman that gives warm hugs from the movie Frozen because we had gotten a call at two in the morning from an elderly woman, uh, and when I got there, I said, ma'am, how can I help you? And she said, I'm really sorry, I don't have a medical problem, I just want a hug. And I gave her a hug, and I ended up with bed bugs and lice. <laughs> so when I came back to work, there's an Olaf doll with a kitchen knife stuck in it. Thank you. And then I have a picture of this because there's no way you'd believe me if I didn't show it to you. But at some point in the hospital, I was very heavily medicated and I didn't know who or where I was. And my guys got to my bedside and they said, Benny, can we get you anything? Anything you want, we'll get it for you. And apparently I said, I need Oreos. And so I woke up <laughs> covered in Oreo cookies. Now I was told I would be sent home, uh, the stitches would come out in a few weeks and I would make a good physical recovery and that was true. What they didn't tell me was about the mental health issues. Now, I travel the country now and share my story. It's usually a 90-minute version of this, but it's all about the mental health. It, I healed within a month physically. It took me years to heal mentally. We have a need here, people, please. This is a, a national problem. But you're not here for Kelly's story. You're not here for my story. You're here for the next speaker. Dr. Trailer has seen this need for the last seven years, and she's been working on a solution she has a plan. She's found a way to fill this need. So that is my time. Thank you, but please welcome Dr. Taylor.
So what can we do to help Ben and Kelly and prevent this from happening again? I'm here to tell you about the SAVER Systems Level Checklist. SAVER stands for Stress and Violence to Fire-Based EMS Responders. It is a grant funded by the FEMA AFG program. It is the first grant funded by the FEMA AFG program to look at the EMS side of fire. And it is run by the Center for Firefighter Injury Research and Safety Trends, the first center at Drexel University in Philadelphia. This is the problem we have that since 1980, the number of fire runs has decreased by about 55%, and the number of EMS runs has increased by 320%. But that's not a problem, right? Because all of your fire departments have hired more staff to meet that need, right? Oh, but FEMA tells us that it's 60% of your work on average. I work with 400 fire departments around the country, and some of those it's 90% of the work. And is that demand with not the right amount of staffing and resources working on your mental health as you've just heard? You betcha. Here's engagement with work, feeling vigorous and dedicated to work. Green is good, red is bad. On fire runs, everyone's highly engaged. On the EMS side in red, not so much. What about the emotional demands of this job? This is a validated psychological scale called burnout. Green is where you want to be, red is where you don't want to be. But on the EMS side, we see in department after department across the country that EMS is what is driving burnout in the fire service. Not that fire doesn't have its burnout, it certainly does, but EMS is driving that train. What you have told us, I have been kicked, punched, bitten, spit on, verbally abused, you name it, I've had it all. And people say, well, in our state, it's a felony to assault a first responder, so at least if I get assaulted on the job, someone's going to jail for five years. Well, we just dropped this paper in coordination with the IASF today, a new paper this week published in the American Journal of Industrial Medicine called Felony Assault Should Stick. And this is what one of your brothers said, and I went to court and this is where it's disheartening because it's supposed to be a felony assault and I'm wasting my time going to court two and three times. I mean, there was no confidence in the system. You shouldn't be able to do that to someone who's trying to help you. Felony assault should stick. And in this paper, we have three recommendations for fire departments and their unions to have the backs of these people when they go to court and make sure that they're not going alone, as Kelly described. What our research has told us in the past is we know three conditions of patients and bystanders that cause your assaults. The underlying medical condition, you're in hypoglycemic shock, you become combative. The mental health conditions of people in the communities you serve. And alcohol and drug abuse like the opioid epidemic that was discussed by your president. In Philadelphia, in that fire department, paramedics are 14 times more likely to be assaulted than their firefighter colleagues who also do first response. And finally, with the International and USFA, we did a report where we looked at what you all have been saying in the industrial literature for 40 years in GEMS and EMS World and your supervisor magazines. You've been talking about workplace violence for 40 years and nobody's been doing anything about it. But we took everything that you said and we put it into a checklist. Not the kind of checklist you're used to on the job. This is your checklist for asthma management. And in healthcare, checklists have been looked at all the time for you, their utility so we don't kill patients in healthcare. So we have good, no medical errors, right? So that's for the patient to make sure you don't screw up. Who has your back? when you're doing that work for the patient. And you have a bystander, like in both of the cases of Ben and Kelly, who assaults. Well, that's where we come in. We developed the Saver Systems Level Checklist to have your back. It is everything that you've said in the literature, in your literature for 40 years, in one checklist. And we brought together 41 subject matter experts from around the country, unions, fire departments, EMS organizations, fire service organizations, scientists, OSHA, NIOSH, old retired guys. <laughs> they got time for me, I love old retired guys. And these two crazy people, 
because we wanted to make sure that it never happens again. And we wanted to make sure that the checklist met Kelly and Ben's standards for, yes, this is going to make a difference. That's what we call, I'm sorry, President, the bullshit card, right? Never heard of that. Okay. So this checklist follows the process of EMS. And that paper is about to drop, and I have it here, and you're going to get it today. And so that checklist starts with the structure of your fire department. And so one of the items on the checklist is, does your department express through policy that verbal and physical violence against members is not tolerated? When you travel to the event, has your department operationalized a flag in your dispatch system to alert EMS responders to previously known violent locations or incidents. When you get to the scene, does your department have protocols on communicating field updates to dispatch and vice versa, like in Ben's case with interagency command and coordination that wasn't there? When you're providing patient care, does your department have policies on de-escalation techniques for various patient conditions? like physical, mental, or metabolic conditions? And do they train the EMS responders in your department how to do those de-escalation techniques? After you've dropped off the patient to add to the emergency department, does your department have a policy that gives EMS responders and supervisors the autonomy to decide what they need physically and mentally after a call prior to returning to service? And in the post-event phase, does your department perpetuate a safe culture for reporting so that members will not feel disrespected or dismissed for reporting a violent event? If you make fun of people who've been assaulted doing their job, if you ostracize people for reporting their injury and telling their stories, do you think they're ever going to tell you again? And I got to tell you something, as your scientist ally, if you're not telling me what's happening to you, when I go to the councilwoman to testify, when I go to Congress to say I need more EMS resources, I've got nothing to stand on. So you've got to start telling those stories. Does your department have a policy that protects an EMS responder's time, either by going out of service or using overtime, so that they can report any incidents of violence? And finally, if that person has to go to court, does your department have a policy that specifies that preparation for the judicial process and court appearances are compensable activities? So you can see that on this checklist, what you're hearing is it's all about policy and training. Does your department have policy? Does your department have training? This is not about asking the EMS responders to do more with less. This is about pushing the responsibility for safety and health back onto the organizations for whom they work. And that's the fire department and also their locals who advocate for safety and health. This is about a paradigm shift of burden. There are a few things that EMS responders need to do. On the checklist for the organization, there are 174 things that the departments and unions have to think about. Are we doing this? Do we have this? But for the EMS responder in the field, there are only six. And they're called pause points. It's actually not a checklist. It's an opportunity for them to say back to the system, I need a moment. Things aren't safe here. I need additional resources. I need action. And it's a way to redistribute authority in the organization that the medic gets to call for what is needed. Here they are. If you have knowledge that this is a previously known violent location, request and wait for law enforcement backup. Before exiting the ambulance are all of the resources you need to safely begin patient care in place, including that police assist. Before transport, does your patient require restraints and have they been checked for weapons? And your department needs to have policy about restraints and weapons in order for a responder to give feedback on this issue. When you've dropped off that patient and your 
cleaning the rig and you're getting ready to go back in service, are you physically and mentally ready? Do you need a moment? Do you need to talk with someone? And if you have experienced verbal or physical violence, have you reported it so we have the data to go advocate for more resources? And just like with your center of excellence, have you sought and received the long-term physical and mental health resources you need to return to work whole and healthy? So we asked these people, and Tom Breyer from the IAFF was there, and we asked these folks, of these 174 items, do you think we can do this? Do you think this is possible in your department? And they said overwhelmingly, half of these items could be immediately actionable, meaning three to six months our departments could get this done. 30%, it's gonna take us a year or two, Jen. And just 12%, this is gonna be extremely difficult two years to never. So it gives us things to do right now. And so we got feedback from people about what we did during this conference where we developed this checklist. This subject has been long overdue. The tracking, data collection, collaborations between labor and management, and awareness of these issues should assist with moving forward in the development of policies and education regarding violence to EMS responders. The environment isn't getting any safer. The streets are getting more dangerous. This is my favorite quote. It's about time someone cared to do something. We hear you at the First Center. We understand that EMS is driving a lot of mental health concerns, burnouts, PTSD, and suicidal ideation. I wish Ben were here to read this one because I'm going to out him. Ben and Kelly were there, and Ben said, this conference is the only time I feel like true progress is being made. You're all making a difference. I hope you know you're going to save lives. And it's going to be because of a policy or training that you suggested through the SABER checklist. Now, this checklist is being implemented in four very large fire-based EMS systems, Philadelphia and Local 22, Chicago Fire and Local 2, San Diego Fire Rescue and Local 145, and Dallas Fire Rescue and Local 58. These four fire departments will be bringing the evidence we need to make sure this checklist works for you and that it decreases the psychological impact of this job using all types of validated psychological scales, including PTSD, anxiety, depression, intention to leave the profession, and suicidal ideation. We expect policy to change, and in Philadelphia, the fire department and Local 22 issued an SOP last year about what commanding officers should do when a member is assaulted. And this policy takes you from capturing the information about the assault from the responder all the way through to someone from labor and management going with them to court. Support for court is really important. We expect training curriculums to be developed because there aren't any. Ben had 10 slides when he went to Paramedic Academy about this issue. That's not enough to give them the protection they need in the field. We expect that this is going to inform the development of EMS staffing standards. I can tell you through NFPA how many fire plugs, where they should be, where fire stations should be, and I know Tom Breyer is going to be talking today at 3 o'clock about NFPA standards for EMS, so hopefully he's going to have some good news for us. But I can't tell you how many paramedics or EMTs we need per 100,000 population or per 100,000 runs, and that puts me in a bad place when I go to testify before city council or Congress. We expect resiliency programs to be developed from these data, and already Dallas Fire Rescue and Local 58 have put forth their own resiliency program to deal with this issue. As Kelly mentioned at 1.30 this afternoon, you can spend some more time with Ben and Kelly, because I know you have more questions from them, and you have more things you want to hear about their stories. The First Center is also going to be there to share with you more about the checklist, more detail, and give you a copy. And you're going to have the opportunity to get enrolled in our focus tool, which measures the organizational commitment to safety in your departments. Already, 400 fire departments have participated and know what their safety climate is like and how it predicts burnout and injuries. So we hope to see you there. Ben and Kelly hope to see you there. Thank you very much, and have a great rest of your conference.